Thank you, Wayne, uh, and thank you, Pat. It's a real privilege, privilege to be here. Uh, I've been here uh, since the very beginning, ISPCS1. Uh, I missed, I think, one year uh, late in the game, uh, but I've been to most of the, the, the 10 years here. And I really believe in the power of 10. The power of 10 is, is a great theme for this conference. Uh, I believe in the power of the one, of the individual, and the power of the species, as, as George Sowers laid out uh, earlier this morning. Uh, if, uh, you know, since many of you have not read his book, I encourage you to do so. Uh, I read it last January, right after it came out, and it's a fascinating read. Uh, and it really shows a path towards the future, and I think a path that those of us from a space perspective uh, really uh, uh, can relate to and can understand and, and, and can get behind. So I encourage you to read that. Um, I would like to talk about the last 10 years and the power of 10 and uh, what uh, the journey has been uh, for commercial space for these last 10 years. But I want to start a little bit further back than that. Um, since Pat did ask me to talk about my own personal journey, um, rather than focusing on Blue Origin today, uh, I wanted to talk about um, where I came from. I, I, I started with uh, the very first space shuttle launch uh, back in 1981. I was a, a young, young lad, uh, 13 years old, living down in Florida. I uh, went to this first space shuttle launch, uh, and then I was fortunate enough uh, 30 years later to be at the very last launch and the last landing. So wheels up and wheels down on the entire program was, was quite moving to me and it, it meant a lot to me. Uh, it still does. And, and I think that having that long-term perspective is what we need as we look at commercial space. As Pat and I were just talking, I'm actually quite frustrated with the pace of, of commercial space. Uh, it's been 10 years since the vision for space exploration. I want to talk a bit about the creation of the vision and, and how it meant something for, for commercial and, and, and the path forward from a government space perspective. Uh, but it really has been frustrating uh, to be 10 years into commercial space, if you will, and 10 years from the XPRIZE uh, and, and to not see a proliferation of activities uh, of people flying regularly. Um, but what we really need to do is keep that long-term perspective um, because really if you're going to maximize the power of the species and, and humanity is going to move out into the stars, we really need to have a long perspective uh, as, as George Sowers laid out this morning. And I think keeping that perspective in mind is helpful um, uh, when we look at commercial space in particular. Uh, I know that for the past 10 years, since I left government in early uh, 2005, for the past 10 years I've been focused on commercial space I immediately went to a company called Transformational Space, or T-Space, uh, helped get the COTS program started, uh, and have been doing commercial space ever since, was president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation for a while, um, and now I'm at Blue Origin, uh, where I get to work for somebody who's equally passionate about space, but more importantly, has the resources to, to focus on it uh, and to, to really make a difference in the, in the world of commercial space. Um, but backing up to the vision, um, the vision was, re was a result of a number of things. Um, most acutely, obviously, it was a result of the Columbia accident. Uh, and the Columbia accident, which said, uh, the investigation board said, yes, there's a technical cause to the failure of Columbia, but there's really an organizational and cultural ca cause um, that NASA didn't have a vision of being on the cutting edge and going out and exploring and moving forward um, and being that leading edge. Uh, and that no one had come behind NASA in, in that 40 years of, of human spaceflight that we'd had. It was still a government-dominated uh, uh, area. And so the, what the vision laid out was setting NASA back on a course to be on the pointy edge of exploration, to move out beyond low Earth orbit, um, first with the moon and then, and then Mars and beyond, but to turn over low Earth orbit to the private sector and to international activities, to really having folks move out and having industry move out beyond um, being the role of being a contractor for NASA, and moving into the role of actually building systems, developing systems, providing services, not just for governments, but for uh, private sector as well. And I think that vision was, was very clearly laid out um, the summer after the vision in January four, uh, 2004. Uh, that summer, the Aldridge Commission uh, headed by former Secretary of the Air Force, Pete Aldridge, clearly laid out that vision saying, turn over LEO to the private sector and NASA get out of the business of operating, owning and operating space systems uh, for LEO. And I think that that led down a path 
uh, that led to COTS and, and commercial crew and the successes that we've seen since. Um, and I think one other key thing that happened in 2004, 10 years ago, was the X Prize. And the X Prize, the winning of the X Prize by, uh, by Scale Composites and, and, um, and, and Burt Rutan's group was key to saying industry can do this. Now, it wasn't orbital space, but it was a mindset change uh, on the part of government watching that and also on the part of the American public. When the American public saw that, there was a huge, tremendous reaction and excitement. Uh, similarly, a couple of years before that, when Dennis Tito first flew uh, up to the International Space Station, paid for a ride on the, on the Russian Soyuz, um, I worked at the White House at the time, and let me tell you, NASA was not happy. NASA was aghast at what was happening. Um, the White House had some consternation, uh, and there were frantic calls to try and get the White House to, to call the Russians and tell them they couldn't do this. In the end, that was not going to happen. That didn't happen. Um, and when, the, when, when Dennis Tito went up, the American public said, wow, that's a great thing. Maybe I get to fly someday. As opposed to, gee, now any billionaire can buy, you know, can buy a ride into space on our government systems and government tax dollars for the space station. You know, so there was a fear that people would think you know, rich people would be um, exploiting government tax dollar uh, uh, activities. Uh, and quite the opposite happened, which was there was an, an enthusiasm on the part of the American public that said, finally, space is opening up to people who can, aren't professional astronauts and can maybe go themselves someday. And so that really was a mind, uh, a mind shift or a, you know, a change in, in perception and paradigm uh, on the part of uh, US government. And what followed after that was uh, a, a series of, um, I think, major programs which are both groundbreaking paradigm shifts for government space and for commercial space but they're in this sort of quasi-hybrid, uh, quasi-government uh, space activity. They're not quite commercial yet. They're not quite fully government the way it had been practiced before. Um, and so the first of that was COTS. And, and COTS was uh, ultimately very successful, uh, led to the development of two new rockets, as well as the development of two new uh, spacecraft to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. And while the the, the program was designed for cargo to the space station, um, the real outcome of it that was uh, more broadly useful was the, the two different launch systems that came out of it and you know, what those capsules might be used for in the future uh, for crew and others. Because there is no market for cargo beyond the International Space Station, beyond a government market. So if it's a captive government uh, market, if you will, and the vast majority of the dollars come from the government, it's still very much a quasi-government activity. Um, commercial crew takes that one step further in that there is a market for people beyond that. Now, who would have thought 10 years ago that we'd be talking about NASA funding two commercial crew providers, NASA actually flying pr their astronauts on privately owned and operated vehicles? That, you know, in, 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 in my view 10 years ago with the vision, I thought that would take a lot longer than that. I thought that was really outside the box of, uh, of where NASA would come, you know, be comfortable uh, operating. And I really thought that it would be from a private sector that would get people into, into low Earth orbit first. Um, but those investments by NASA have been tremendous. Uh, now, in the future, uh, anybody that brings along a better mousetrap, brings along a better capsule, has a mechanism to get into to providing uh, rides for NASA astronauts. And not only that, those companies that are providing those services to NASA are also going to be providing them to the private sector and to other folks, multiplying the number of people that fly into space. And after all, our goal is millions of people living and working in space. And to get there, we can't do it just based on, on government space activities alone. We need that private investment. We need those private systems. And we need to be flying private people to do more things. Uh, and I think that those, those NASA programs are, are, are very significant. Um, I think they came on the heels of, of multiple attempts at, at space commercialization uh, that were all really dependent on government markets and government money. Um, and, and again, I, I tend to think of crew as the first market that can really go beyond government. Because there are, as, as 
you know, we talked about before, there's seven billion people on this planet, uh, and pretty much every one of them would want to get into space. Uh, and so while in the beginning it will be those that, you know, can, can afford it, uh, that price point will come down as we start to fly more. I'm very excited about that. There have been a couple of non-government space activities uh, that, uh, that uh, have really defined the last decade. Um, I'm thinking, you know, uh, Virgin Galactic, X-Core, Blue Origin. Um, those, those activities so far are all in the investment phase. We're investing in the capabilities um, and they have yet to bear fruit in terms of revenues and market. Uh, but I have full confidence that, that those will, uh, and then ultimately um, that, that they will be providing services back to the government as well as to the broad private sector in the future. Um, I'm going to end uh, in just a second here, but I, I, I didn't want to uh, get off the stage without mentioning a little bit about Blue Origin. Um, you know, we uh, made an announcement several weeks ago with United Launch Alliance about the development of the new BE-4. Uh, rocket engine, very large uh, rocket engine, 550,000 pounds of thrust, uh, liquefied natural gas and, and liquid oxygen as the propellants. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, and this is one of those examples of, of a purely commercial activity. It's fully funded by the private sector, by two private companies uh, using private money. Um, we're about three years into the development of that engine. We're hoping to fly or have that finished and flight ready by the end of 17 with a first launch in 2019 on a ULA rocket. Um, and we're very excited about that. But this, this, this progression that we've had over the last decade um, uh, from fully government activities to, to hybrid uh, government commercial activities and to now some fully commercial activities bearing fruit. Uh, it's been exciting to watch. As I mentioned before, it's also been a little bit frustrating at the pace of it. Uh, but we're all out there working it together. Uh, and I commend it, each and every one of you for being involved in it and for, for for making it happen, because without us, it's really not going to make it happen. Uh, it's not going to happen. So with that, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And thank you, Pat. Thank you, Wayne.